Thank you, Father. Lord, we worship you tonight. You are a holy God. And we do worship you and thank you and give you all the praise and all the worship for your, what you're doing in our own personal lives, our individual lives. But we thank you, Father, that what you're doing across the body of Christ, all across the whole world, Father, that you're sending revival. You're sending a great outpouring of the Spirit of God. And it is upon us, Lord. Thank you, Father God, at the day of your coming that we shall be ready. Help us, Father, that we would be found in you. And we would pray, Father, like Paul prayed over in the book of Colossians when he said, Help us, Father, to regulate our lives. Regulate our lives in conformity and in union with you. Help us to be rooted and grounded in you. Ever established in you. Increasing more and more in the grace of God. Growing, Lord Jesus, in the love of God. That we might come to the fullness of him that fill it all in all in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, we thank you for your glorious, wonderful written word that teaches us. We thank you for the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost tonight to teach. That unction would teach us. No man would teach but your unction, according to your word. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27, says the unction of God would teach us. And so we're expecting you to teach us. We're expecting to know more of you tonight. Thank you for your presence here in our midst and among us because you said it would be. And in the name of Jesus, we worship and praise you and thank you for it. And all the saints of God said, Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you may be seated. Shake hands with your neighbor or something. Tell him something nice. Amen. Glory to God. Romans, the 8th chapter, and we see in verse 26, it says, the Amplified Bible says this, So too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid. Aren't you glad? The Holy Spirit comes to our aid and He bears us up in our weakness. Translated uh, in the Greek, it says there, So the Holy Spirit comes to our aid in our in, and bears us up in our inability to produce results. And we found out that sometimes where prayer is concerned, we just don't have the ability to produce the results that we would need to. We talked about how sometimes you want to pray for somebody and you can just go so far in your understanding. But down on the inside of you, in your spirit man, you know that we we are a spirit. We have a soul and we live in a body. Down in your spirit, you're just... It seems like there just needs to be something else that you would pray about. It, you'd, I don't know, you're just not through or something. And so the Bible says here that the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and He bears us up in our weakness or in our inability to produce results. For we do not know what to pray, what prayer to offer, or how to offer it worthily as we ought. But it says the Spirit Himself goes to meet our supplication and He pleads in our behalf with groanings that, my Bible says, He pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. Now, the original translation says, in articulate language, our meaning a language that we do not know and that we do not understand. And so, we see that the Holy Spirit is a tremendous help to us when we're needing to pray. But you know that you have to put confidence in the Holy Ghost to help you when you're praying. Remember we read the scripture over in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 5. And I'll read that one quickly to you. Paul, they're speaking to the Galatians. He's rebuking them. And he says, he says, Are you so foolish and so senseless and so silly, having begun with the Holy Spirit? Are you now reaching perfection by dependence on your flesh? Have you suffered so many things and experienced so much, all for nothing and to no purpose? Then does He, who supplies you with His marvelous Holy Spirit and works powerfully and miraculously among you, does He do it by what the law demands or does He do it by your believing? So we can see here that a prerequisite for the Holy Spirit helping you where prayer is concerned is in your believing. You must believe. Now, this is something. If you'll turn just a few chapters over to Romans 12. Let me just see where this scripture is. This was just kind of uh, awakened to my heart here. 
This scripture in Romans 12 is, is, is speaking here of the body of Christ and it's talking about gifts and talents. And it's talking here about faith and it says in verse, uh, we won't, we won't read verse 3, we'll read it verse 4, it says, For as in one body we have many parts and all these parts do not have the same function or use. So we, numerous as we are, are one body in Christ the Messiah and indi- individually we are parts one of the, of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. He whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. And it goes on there, speaking of exhortation and a lot of different giftings there. And we have used this scripture many times. We've used it to talk about there being different measures of faith, where if we were teaching on healing or we were teaching on... Uh, other things, prosperity or whatever. We've talked about there being different measures of faith for those things. But actually here in context, this scripture is speaking of, it's talking about faith to minister. It's talking about, about talents and qualities. The grace that God has given you in your own heart for your own calling. And, and I found this. I've never heard anyone ever speak in other tongues that wasn't believing for it or did not believe in it. Have you? No. Because you have to have faith to speak in tongues. That's what the Bible just said over in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 5. It said there you, that the Holy Spirit will work powerfully and miraculously among you, but according to your measure of faith. And I said all that to say this to you. I remember that when, when I first began to speak in other tongues uh, in the year uh, uh, 1973, yeah, 1973, when I began to speak in other tongues, you know, uh, my tongues, they, they were very simple, very, very repetitious. And, and a lot of times they would be the same words over and over again. But I found this over the years. As I would grow in faith, Wear tongues. If I, if I would just school myself in that. Last week we talked about he who prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself, the Bible says in Jude. Verse, I believe it is, 21. It says he who prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. And so I found that as I would use tongues in my own private prayer life, that my faith would grow. As I would study the Word where it was con- my, concerned, my faith would grow. And, and where tongues was concerned, uh, as I schooled myself in that, uh, my capacity to receive more, just like a language, would, it would grow more and more and more and more. And, um, in fact, uh, there's a brother here that, uh, we pray with sometimes and over the years. He has so, in fact, he's part of our pastoral staff. He, he, he has so schooled himself where tongues, where the gift of tongues is concerned, that his tongues are so easy to interpret. You know, Paul said, pray that you may interpret. It's amazing. It is amazing. You, you, will, you will pray according to the measure of your faith. And so that's why it's so important that you use tongues, that you, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost uh, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, it's important that you use them. Not just throw them away somewhere and put them on the shelf. Uh, old line Pentecostals used to do that a lot. They used to not use every, they, they, they thought the only time that you prayed in tongues was when you got an unction. What we call an unction or an anointing. Well, you know that you do get an unction. We do get an anointing to pray. But that's not the only time. And we went back, we talked the last three weeks about the purpose and the scope of tongues where our prayer life was concerned and you can get the tapes and go back and see those purposes at another time. But what I'm wanting to say to you right here is that you will grow where that. You will grow as your faith grows and you will be able to reach further and further into your own heart. You will gain a greater and a greater capacity. Now, notice here in Romans the 8th chapter. Oh, and then 12. I have to go back now. Romans the 8th chapter. And verse 26 again. It speaks here of, of when it says... Uh, talks about groanings too deep for utterance, or we could say travail. Tonight we're going to talk about groaning and travail, simply because you don't hear much about it uh, 
just lately. We used to teach on it more than we do now, and I don't know what happened to it. But it's a very real part of prayer. It's not something that you hear a lot out. Uh, we don't have that so much in our services. or But, but in, in the closed closet of prayer, it is, uh, it is, it's important. And uh, the Holy Spirit will, will, will work that in you uh, as you go. I want you to remember this. Old-line Pentecostals used to call it agonizing in prayer. Because the word travail means that. We'll look at a scripture in a few minutes over in Galatians, the fourth chapter, what Paul said about it. He, they called it agonizing in prayer, and I, I can kind of understand that now. But let's look at some scriptures where it's concerned. In Isaiah 66, I want you to notice something here. Very interesting. Isaiah. I'm, I'm not talking really fast tonight. I feel like I'm going like a machine gun. I'm sorry. I'll slow down here. I have a lot, of, lot to cover in a short time and just have to move fast like that, you know? Praise the Lord. Isaiah 66, verse 7. Now notice what it said here. Before Zion travailed, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she was delivered of a man-child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Or shall a nation be brought forth in a moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I who cause to bring forth shut up the womb, says your God? Now, as we look into the Old Testament, Old Testament scriptures, Old Testament uh, prophecies, we find that at times there will be a twofold meaning to a scripture. It will be, uh, a, there will be a natural meaning and there will be also a spiritual meaning. Now talk, it's talking here about naturally, it's talking about the nation of Israel and the nation of Israel being born. And we know that she was in the year uh, 1948, I believe. But then it t- talks about Zion. It said, as soon as Zion travailed, she gave b- birth. Now here, when it talks about Zion, he's not talking just about Israel. Okay? It, let's hold our finger there in Isaiah 66. And we'll go over to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. And verse 18, we'll begin there at verse 18. And it's speaking here of Moses on Mount Sinai when he received the tables of the Lord, of the law. The tables of the law. It says, uh, verse um, 18, For you have not come, as did the Israelites in the wilderness, to a material mountain that can be touched, a mountain that is ablaze with fire and to, and to gloom and darkness and a raging storm and the blast of a trumpet and the voice whose words make the listeners beg that nothing more he said to them. For they could not bear the command that was given. For even a wild animal touches the mountain, the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. In fact, so awful and terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling with fear. Now it says here that we didn't come to that mountain. We didn't come, it's speaking here of the church, well you'll see that in a minute, said you didn't come to that, that mountain, Mount Sinai. But it says here in verse 22, but rather you have reproached unto Mount Zion, even, now notice that, you have approached unto Mount Zion, even the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to countless multitude of angels, and to the church, the assembly of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven. Now, who is the church, the assembly of the firstborn? Remember that Jesus was the firstborn, wasn't he? And we got born after Jesus, right? So we have come into the assembly of the firstborn, uh, firstborn who are registered in heaven. Hallelujah. I'm glad we're registered in heaven. And to the judge who is God of all, and to the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect, and to Jesus 
the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkling of blood and a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out for vengeance. So see to it that, and then it goes on there. So notice here, it says here, speaks here of Zion. Zion being spiritually, Zion is a type here of the church. Now, if we go back to Isaiah 66, now go back over there a moment, we'll see this. We can see here that it said that soul travail and weeping is sometimes necessary for bringing things forth. All right? For bringing children forth. Sometimes for for people to be born again into the kingdom of God, sometimes there is a travail. There is a groaning. Uh, let's turn over to... Uh, uh, First Samuel. This scripture was just kind of came to me. First Samuel chapter one. We'll see a great example of this. First Samuel chapter one. Now this is the uh, Hannah. Now this lady, she so desired a son, and uh, she didn't have one. She was barren, and so she so desired one, and so it says that she was in great distress, and uh, she began to cry out to the Lord. She came to the Lord praying and crying out to Him in weeping and travail. Now listen to what it says about her in verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 1. And Hannah was in distress of soul, praying to the Lord and weeping bitterly. She vowed, saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid... And earnestly and remember and not forget your handmaid, but will give me a son. I will give him to the Lord all his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli noticed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Eli said to her, How long will you be intoxicated? I mean, this, this praying that she did made her look drunk. Almost like she was drunk. He said, how long will you be intoxicated? Put wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I am pouring out my soul before the Lord. Well, we know that she was praying and she was in soul travail for this child, for Samuel. Now, I want you to notice something about this scripture here. It says here, in verse 11, it said, She vowed, saying, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on my affliction. Now, it was good she said that. Now, she saw in her own heart her affliction as being, I don't have a son. But the Lord, when she said that, he saw much further than that. He saw that Israel needed a deliverer. And that Hannah, that was an affliction. And she didn't even know it was an affliction at that time. She wasn't intending to pray about that. But you see, the Spirit of God, as her helper, came upon her. And she, was in, she, she was, thought she was only praying for this child, for this Samuel. Now, I want you to notice... Well, we know that she she uh, do, she gets pregnant and she does have a little boy and his name is Samuel, which means heard of God. And she brings him over into uh, uh, to the Lord's house in Shiloh to have him dedicated to the Lord. And when he when they bring him over there, as she as he is being dedicated to the Lord, the power of God comes on Hannah and she begins to prophesy. Now listen to what she says when she prophesies. Hannah prayed and said, uh, verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts and triumphs in the Lord. My horn is lifted up in the Lord. My mouth is no longer silent, for it is opened wide over my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. This is kind of like a, would be like, a, by the spirit of prophecy, would be like a song of deliverance that she stands and gives before the people there. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no right, rock like our God. Talk no, t- 
talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance go forth from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren, speaking of herself here, has borne seven, but she who has many children languishes and is forlorn. Now notice that. It said there, the barren, she was a barren woman, the barren has borne seven. Okay, now drop down to verse 21 here, and it says of here, the Lord visited Hannah, so that she bore three sons, two daughters, and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Okay? So we see. Now remember she said that by the spirit of prophecy. She is speaking that song of deliverance there. She said, he, she, said she has born seven. She was barren and she has born seven. All right. Now let's see who the seven are. The Lord visited Hannah and she bore Three sons, that's three. Two daughters, that's five. Samuel, that's six. Where is the seven? The seven is found in verse 10 where she begins to pray here. And, and I mean, where is she is prophesying here. In verse 10 it says, she says this, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them will he thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge all the pe- pieces the people to the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his, of his anointed the Christ now if you if you uh, look in in commentaries you will find here that this is the law of first mention right here this is the first time that you have ever ever seen that word Christ or the anointed one mentioned in the Bible, this is the first time that you see it right here in First Samuel. And I, so what I believe here is I believe that her prayers were, and, and if you read commentaries, they'll say this, Hannah thought her prayer was in this tiny little secluded area right here in her own home. But by the Spirit of God, she was reaching forward even into another dispensation And she was travailing and weeping for the great Deliverer that is our Savior today. Isn't that blessed? Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So, a lot of times we'll see that people, to be born again, uh, Christians a lot of times don't know this, for people to really be born again, there, there, there must be groaning and travail. Also, let's see what Paul said over in Galatians, the fourth chapter. Concerning groaning and travail. Galatians, the fourth chapter. Galatians. Come out, Galatians. Galatians, the fourth chapter. And the 19th verse. In verse, in verse uh, 19 of Galatians chapter 4, he says, uh, my little children, for whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Now, this is very, very interesting. Paul here is writing to the churches at Galatia. And this letter of, of uh, here to the Galatians was read throughout all the churches in Galatia. And um, uh, the, all these churches had sprung up because of the missionary work that Paul and Silas and Barnabas had done, primarily Paul. And you see that here how he says, he calls them my little children, because I believe they were his converts. Now notice he said, uh, I travail in birth again for you. Notice he said, I travail in birth again. Remember that over there we read that Zion travailed? It when Zion travailed, her children would be brought forth. Okay? There's that word right here again, travail, again. He is insinuating that he, if he said, I travail again, that means he is insinuating that he 
travailed for them the first time to be born again. And then he is travailing for them again that Christ would be formed in them, that they would not remain baby Christians, but they would grow on up into Christ where they needed to be. Now, remember over in Isaiah 66, the Bible says there, he, the writer compares this kind of praying to a woman giving birth to a child, meaning there is discomfort, there is a weeping, there is, like those old saints of God would say, an agonizing, okay, agonizing in prayer. I can remember back, uh, it must have been 20 years ago, uh, yeah, it was 20 years ago now, that um, I, somebody had given me uh, uh, this, a book, it wasn't this book, but it was similar to this book. Um, and it's, um, the name of the man was David Brainerd. I don't know if you've all, have ever read this book before. I don't think there's any in the bookstore. They told me they would order something for you. But anyway, it's very interesting. This man, very interesting man. And, uh, I was wanting, you know, anything that I could get on prayer or whatever. And somebody gave me this book. And I was so inspired by this man and his desire to see people come to Christ, to see the heathen one. And you know, that's such a desire where this church is concerned, you know, for, to, to win the lost. And so um, I, when I read his, this kind of, it's a diary of his life, when I, when I read this, I began to see that I did not have in me the earnestness or the desire for people to be saved like he did. Now, I don't know about you, but where I am concerned, where the things of God are concerned, if I see somebody has something in God that I don't have, I say, I'm, I don't know, I just am a hungry person. If I see something that, that, that somebody has that I don't have, I, I want that. I don't draw back from it. And, and, and wonder, I want it. Because I want everything that God has for me in my life. I want to serve Him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I want to love Him that way, and I want to know God. That is my quest for my life. Amen, sister. I'm glad that you agree. But anyway, and so I was so in awe by this man. Uh, not really him, but the way that he sought God. And I, I just was going to read... Uh, a couple of things to you here. This was on June the 28th of 1744. Uh, this man, he didn't live very long. He had such a burden for the Indians in Delaware, the American Indians. And he did not speak their language, the Indians' language. And so there was no way really for him to witness to them unless God would do something, unless some kind of power would come upon him or, or, or God would change his language, or, or something. There was no way that he could reach them. Yet, this absolutely inwrought force was on the inside of him, so much so that he called these Indians, my Indians. He made them mine. And you know, it, um, I, over the past years, you know, I used to pray about Minneapolis, that you would save Minneapolis that the Lord would save Minneapolis. But through the years, I've noticed about my own self that I've been calling it my city. You know, when something gets lodged on the inside of you from God, it becomes yours. And if it doesn't become yours, then it's real hard for you to get real tenacious about it and earnest about it. But anyway, I'll just read you a couple of things here. He said, I spent the morning in reading several parts of the Holy Scripture and in fervent prayer for my Indians. That God would set up His kingdom among them and bring them into His church. About nine, I withdrew to my usual place of retirement in the woods, and there again enjoyed some assistance in prayer. My great concern was for the conversion of the heathen to God, and the Lord helped me to plead with Him for it. Towards noon wrote up to the Indians in order to preach for them. And while going, my heart went up to God in prayer for them, could freely tell God he knew 
that the cause in which I was engaged was not mine, but that it was his own cause, and that it was be for his own glory to convert the poor Indians. And blessed be God, I felt no desire for their conversion that I might receive honor from the world as being the instrument of it. You can see his, how humble he was. Had some freedom in speaking to the Indians. One time he had a, a, a drunken interpreter. Uh, one of the greatest moves of God he had with the Indians was, was when he had an interpreter and he was drunk the whole time he interpreted. Okay, then this next day he says, Awoke this morning in the fear of God. After I arose, I spent some time reading God's word and in prayer. I cried to God under a sense of my great indigence. Last year I longed, last year I longed to be prepared for a world of glory and speedily to depart out of this world. But of late, all my concern almost is for the conversion of the heathen. And for the end, and for that end, I long to live. But blessed be God, I have less desire to live for any of the pleasures of the world than I ever had. I long and love to be a pilgrim and want grace to imitate the life, the labors of Paul among the heathen. And, w- and when I long for holiness now, it is not so much for myself as formerly, but rather that thereby I may com- become an able minister of the new covenant, especially to the heathen. Spent about two hours this morning reading and in prayer by turns, and was in a watchful, tender frame, afraid of everything that might cool my affections and draw away my heart from God. Isn't that something? Towards night, my burden respecting my work among the Indians began to increase much, and I was aggravated by hearing sundry things which looked very discouraging, in particular, They intended to meet together the next day for an idolatrous feast and dance. Then I began to be in anguish. I thought that I must in conscience go and endeavor to break them up, yet knew not how to attempt such a thing. However, I withdrew for prayer, hoping for strength from above. In prayer, I was exceedingly enlarged, and my soul was as much drawn out as I ever remember it to have been, In my life, I was in such anguish and pleaded with so much earnestness and importunity that when I arose from my knees, I felt weak and overcome. I could scarce walk straight. It seemed my joints were loosed and the sweat ran down my face and body and nature seemed as if it would dissolve. So far as I could judge, I was wholly free from selfish ends in my fervent supplication for the poor Indians. I knew that they were met together to worship devils and not God, and this made me cry all the earnestly that God would now appear and help me in my attempts to break up this idolatrous meeting. And he goes on here and talks more about that. So you can see, well, I, I began to read about this man. I read about that, and when I read about him, I don't know that I read that exactly, but I read in his diary, just so you would know and understand where I was coming from. I began to, uh, re- I read that book, and when I did, because I didn't have that earnestness, because I did not have that desire to see people saved. Now, I care about people being saved. You know, people get saved. I say, oh, that's wonderful. Isn't that great? Oh, very great. But on the inside of me, it wasn't like I didn't have that. You understand what I mean? I didn't have that earnestness. And that desire that I would call somebody mine. And so when I saw that, I began to seek God about it. And it was a process of time. And over the next few months and few years, uh, there, there did come into my heart a very, very, given, I believe, by the Holy Ghost, a very painful concern for all of unsaved humanity. And uh, I found myself in great soul travail for, for different ones at different times and throughout the years. You know, after our church began, I can, uh, pass, I can remember Pastor and I standing up. It, the church began in 1980, and I can remember Pastor and I standing up and, in the church service, and we would say, Now, we're going to believe God for five people to be saved this week. 
And I am telling you something right now. To get five people saved, it, 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 we would shout on Sunday morning, we would praise and worship God for five people. And, and it was just like pulling teeth. I mean, it was, uh, even though, you know, uh, we were believing. And so we started a prayer meeting uh, on, Tuesday, on Monday night. Well, first of all, it started on Tuesday night, but then we changed over to Monday night. And there were five of us that got together on Monday nights, and we would pray for this city, and we'd pray for souls. Now, this was before we came into this building. We were over at North Hennepin then. But then when we moved over here, there were some other people that joined us. Some of the, There's people in here that were in that group that joined us. And we found the most interesting thing. When Nikki would go out on the streets on, um, on Monday nights, we would stay back. And instead of going on the streets, we would pray. And we found the most amazing thing happened to us. Just, just, you know, we would start off and we would start off praying in tongues. We would pray as far as we could in our understanding, as far as we knew about the city. But then, you know, the Lord, we didn't know. So what do you do when you don't know? We established last week, the Bible says, when you don't know, you pray in other tongues when you're led on purpose because you don't know. And so we would begin praying like that, but we would find that there would come an unction. There would come an anointing upon us, and we would begin to travail. And it was, it was the most amazing thing. I mean, it, sometimes it would come on all of us at once. Other times, it would come on just one or two, and you would kind of be like almost like you would wait your turn or something. I don't know, with anointing. And, and we would just pray like that, pray and pray. Well, we, we prayed like that for, it must have been three years, every Monday night. And without much results. And all of a sudden, we started sensing on Monday night that there was something happening. That something had been altered. And, and something was being set into motion that we, we, of course, did not understand that the Holy Spirit was working. And I remember it was a service that was on a Sunday night in September. And uh, there was a word that came from the Lord that the streets would be different. And that God was going to send an outpouring. And uh, Nikki and a bunch of pastors, I think it was, laid hands to... Any of y'all remember that service? Uh, anybody? Anybody? Joni does. Anybody else in here? Uh, Erica does. But, but we laid hands on everybody that was going on the streets on Monday night. And from that time, from that Sunday night, that Monday night, it was almost like revival hit. I've forgotten how many people we had go on the streets uh, that night, but from that time forth, uh, we got we we started moving, and and we you know, and I think this year we paid what what was it, thirty five thousand we prayed with on the streets of Minneapolis this year. But I believe that all of that started in that prayer place, and I I, I believe that with all of my heart. And on, on the same in the same way, I also believe. That where people are concerned, uh, where people are concerned that need to grow on up into God. Now I've noticed this. Not everybody that is born again needs to have travail and groaning behind it. But there are people that do. And there are people that will never come into the kingdom of God unless there is travail and groaning. There are people. It, the Bible says until Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. And, uh, oh, my, 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 we've had some marvelous things. And uh, we have been praying so much lately for, for uh, about the church. More along the lines of Galatians chapter 4, where Paul said, I travail again that Christ be formed in you. Now, I want to tell you this about travail and groaning. Travail and groaning is not something that you do. Just in your own self. There is a difference between praying in tongues, just like we normally would pray in tongues, just allowing the Holy Spirit to be your helper, that you would edify yourself or that you would pray for someone. Uh, praying in other tongues uh, where there's an unction that comes. Now, this is what I'm talking about. You cannot pray travail and groaning in the flesh. It is a manifestation of the Holy Ghost, and it's as the Spirit wills. But guess what? 
for this day and for the hour that we're living in, for the great harvest that is to come before the Lord Jesus Christ appears, before that great harvest comes, there has got to be travail. And I believe that God is bringing it mightily back into the church. You know how over in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the Bible talks about the spirit of prayer. It said praying with all kinds of prayer in the spirit. The church needs a spirit of prayer. The spirit of prayer to help us to bring forth. And so um, I decided that tonight, I don't know how long we've gone. We've got about 15 minutes. Now, because... We can, you, you cannot say that travail and groaning is coming because it's a manifestation. And listen to me about this. You never ever, where prayer is concerned, get your eyes on manifestations. Are you listening to me? The Holy Ghost will do marvelous, the Bible said, He will work powerfully and miraculously among you. Say me. But you never, ever get your eyes on manifestations. When you pray, you keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep your eyes on... Then you, then you don't get off into flaky things. You see, if you get your eyes on manifestations, I'll tell you what you'll do. You might get a manifestation sometime in prayer. You might, you might move over into weeping and travail. And then if you get your eyes on that manifestation, the next time... You go to prayer, you'll be, you'll be looking, you'll be looking for that. No, what you do is, you get your eyes on Jesus. Jesus, the Bible said, He's the author, He's the finisher. He knows just how to pray. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. And so we get our eyes on Him. We look to Jesus. So tonight, I have it so strong after Sunday night and we were talking about, um, about the church. And being holy unto God, being separated and being consecrated unto the will of God and unto the power of God for our lives. And as we said that Sunday night, such such a burden came upon my heart for the church. Be kind of like uh, Paul said, I travail that Christ would be formed in us. That we would become imitators and copiers of Christ. That we would be like Him. That's our, that is our goal. Is to be like Jesus. If you're a Christian, the difference between becoming a Christian and being a Christian, if you are a Christian, you're becoming more like Him every day because that is your great desire to be like Him. We desire to, to love and to reach out. And so we're becoming more like Him. And so it came into my heart, all that the Bible won't go into that, but it came so strong into my heart uh, Sunday night as we were praying about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus prayed in John the 17th chapter. And he said, Lord, you make us one, even as the Father and I are one. And that the church would come into unity. Well, for us to come into unity together... We're going to have to grow up into Him. For the next little bit till we get released, we're going to either make your chair an altar or you can come around up here and get down on your knees. Let's get on our knees tonight. Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's get on our knees. Sometimes, as you know, you sit up in your chair or whatever. And unless your knees hurt, if your knees hurt or something, then you can sit up in your chair however. But let's get on our knees tonight. And pray for the church. Pray for unity in the body of Christ. Pray that we would be one. Pray that the Lord would work, that we would come to the fullness of Him that feels all in all. Pray that the Father, that the, the Spirit of wisdom and revelation would come and that He would flood our hearts with light so that we would understand the hope of our calling, our inheritance, that which we're to come into. Let's pray about that. Now, remember that we'll pray as far as we can in English. And what do you do when you don't know? What? And so you pray in tongues. So we'll go as far as we can in English tonight. And then uh, then we'll begin to pray in tongues. Because the Bible says, He that prays in an unknown tongue, prays the plans and the purposes of God. And God has a plan. He has a plan to bring the church forth in this hour. And we can pray about that. Maybe we don't know everything with our head. 
But our heart does. And the Holy Spirit down on the inside of us knows. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, make your chair an altar, or maybe some of you want to come up here around the front, have an altar service. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. We turn our eyes unto you tonight. We look at you, O oh Father. Your glorious face. Oh, Father, we come before the throne boldly because you said for us to. Believing, Father God, that we receive tonight. We release our faith in the name of Jesus that the things that we pray about will surely come to pass because they are your word. They are promises, Father God. Promises concerning the outpouring of God for this day and for this hour. Oh, Father, we lift up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We lift up the church. Oh, Jesus, oh, head of the church, you move according to your spirit. Move. Move according to the word of God in the name of Jesus. Where the church is concerned. Oh, Father. Oh, Father, you send the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Send a great revealing. Open our eyes, oh God. Open our eyes. Open our ears, oh Father God. Open our hearts to receive more. Oh Father, you call the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to be hungry, to hunger, and to thirst after you. Cause the people of God not to be sluggish and dull of perception. Oh Father, not to be lazy. Oh Lord God, but help us, Father, to be awake. As Paul said for us to wake up, help us to awake and arise to our calling, arise to that place. Flood us, O God, flood our hearts with light. Oh, that we would know your marvelous and wonderful presence, Lord. Send the rain upon your people. Oh, Father God, send the rain. Send the rain, the outpouring of your Spirit with signs and wonders and miracles, Father. Oh, Father, you perfect that, oh God, which concerns us. You perfect that which concerns us, concerns your people, oh Father. Oh, resist in the Cambra. Yes, Father, assistance by your Spirit in the name of Jesus. Assistance now by your Spirit. Assistance, and you apprehend those that are to be apprehended. Oh, Father, we pray for ministers in the body of Christ. That that voice, Father God, you would anoint them with words from heaven. You would anoint them, Father God, that they would be a voice of one crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. We pray, O oh Father, that you would anoint them with fresh oil in Jesus' name. As a pokoristina, and all a get reached as a sicky boasting and a massacre dostilista. Father, it's in your hand now, it's in your hand, Father. Oh, Father, how you desire to save those that are lost. How that you desire those to save those that are perishing. Father, bring the church into our place. Bring her up into our place. Oh, Father, you give her a desire to see people come to God. Give her a desire, Father. For the world, for the world to know Jesus, for the world to see the glory of God, and to see what you have for this hour, oh Father, help us not to be satisfied, Lord, but help us, Father, that there be a dissatisfaction and a restlessness on the inside of us, Lord. Help us, Father God, to go on. We must go on now. Help us to be filled with your Spirit, Lord Jesus. Yes, Father, and we pray that in your body that you would thrust forth laborers, Lord. Laborers unto the fields, Father God. Help us, Father God. Help laborers to be hurled into the places in the world that don't know Jesus. Help them obedience of your spirit, O oh God. Help them to obey, Father. Strengthen those, Father God. Strengthen them in their inner man. Strengthen those that are weak, O oh Father. Strengthen the hands that hang down. 
and the needs that are weakened, Lord. Especially those in the foreign fields, oh Father, we pray. We pray, oh God. We pray, oh Father, for those in the nations, Lord. With the gospel, give them a voice, Lord. A voice, Lord Jesus. Give them a voice, oh Father God. Help the glory. Let them have the glory, Father, in their meetings and in their crusades, Father God. Oh, Father, we pray for the multitudes, the multitudes, the multitudes to know you, Father. And reach them on a capsule of gold, Oh, Father, but there must be an opening of our eyes, Lord. You must open our, on our eyes and give us further revelation, Father, of who you are. We must see Jesus. We must see Jesus now. Father, you give us help now. Help from heaven. It's time, oh God. It's time that doors would be open. Supernatural doors. Doors of utterance, Lord. Biological doors. Oh, doors across the earth to be open, Father, that the gospel can go forth and be preached. And there must be a be obedience come from your people, Father God. And do silicator bust us so. Oh, Father, you help us. Help us to walk in holiness. Help us to walk in righteousness, oh God. Not turning from the right or to the left. Oh, but Lord, you help us. Help us to walk in holiness, Father. And just as that prophet, that age-old prophet Isaiah, saw you, Father, at the throne. And when he saw the throne, Lord, he saw the seraphim crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. Lord Jesus, you cause us to see your holiness. Help us, Father, to walk with pure hearts, with clean hands before you, Father God. Help us to be of right character and of clear conviction, O oh Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray now for backsliders, those that have gone back into the world, those that have one time walked the aisle and prayed, Father God, for you to come into their hearts in some way or another. The enemy of their soul has come in <laughs> and has caused them to stray off, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to bring them home, to bring them home, Father, to bring them back, bring back to Father's house in the name of Jesus, and that they would have a zeal and a hunger for God and for the things of God. And your race is a gift of us to the sun. And your bands, the more on all of Gandimus, so to the best it is. A recycle, a ticket of Bosta. And already the gear was all the best in the name. All the big care is to stop all the best. And Father, we pray for those that are sick in the body of Christ, Father. Oh, that they would turn unto Jesus, their healer. They would know Him as their healer, not only as a Savior, but as their healer. Father, we pray for those that are sick, that they would know You, Father. They would know You, Father. Strengthen them now. Lift them up, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. O Sikelebasa, Embrens Emanumokores, Sustinides, Tudosta. But most of all, Father, we pray that the prayer that Jesus prayed, that was prayed in John 17, before he went there to the cross. Father God, we know that that prayer was heard. And that prayer is being heard. And Father, we know that it will be heard until the day of its doing. And so, Father, we thank you for that prayer. And we thank you. And we're in agreement with Jesus in his prayer. Thank you for the glory to the church. Thank you for each one in this room tonight, Lord. Each person here. We apply the blood of Jesus to our lives, to every Christian here. And we thank you, Father God. We thank you, Lord, right now that you're moving in our midst, that you move in our own hearts, Father. 
Thank you, Father God, that you move in our own hearts. Don't leave us behind, but Father, move in us. Give us a hunger and a zeal and a thirsting after you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thank you, Father God. We worship you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and all the strength and all the power to the one that saved us, the one that delivered us, the one that redeemed us, Jesus. We worship him and give him glory tonight.